It's Steve here at iResponding.com. Today we're going to be taking a look at how to set up two-tone detect on a Raspberry Pi. The basic concept behind two-tone detect is trying to get your radio's audio into your computer. The image shown here shows the sound going from the tower into the radio, into the computer, and then out to you and your members. To run two-tone detect on a Raspberry Pi computer, here's a shopping list of some items that you may need. You may not need every single one of these items, but this is a list of things that we have found helpful and that I'll be showing you in the upcoming slides. For a listening device, we're going to be using a radio that we bought off the internet. You can see in some of the images that we are using what's called a battery delete. This device does not need to be plugged into, or plugged into or sitting in a charging cradle. It also doesn't have a true battery. We used a battery delete so that the device is hardwired for power. Two-Tone Detect can pick up the electronic field of a charging cradle, and that can cause some interference when we're trying to listen to your tones. So if you can, try to use something that is hardwired for power source. You're going to need to have an audio cable. If possible, get a shielded audio cable. A shielded audio cable has a special coating that helps prevent electronic fields from interfering with the audio going through the cable itself. For Raspberry Pi, you need to have an external sound card. In this case, we're going to be using this sound card, which does have an input and an output. This specific device requires that both ports are used in order for the sound card to work correctly. So if you only have something plugged into the audio input and you're not getting it to work correctly, plug something into the audio output. Even if it's just a, a wire going to nowhere, it needs to have something plugged in in order to work correctly. Here's a view of the full audio hardware setup. We can see the radio with the power source wire coming in from the bottom. The audio is coming out to the side and going directly into the USB sound card. Here we have the Raspberry Pi itself. You can see, of course, it does have its power source. And there's a white HDMI cable to go out to a monitor of your choice. Here's the combination of the audio and the Raspberry Pi itself. The radio plugged into the audio cable. The audio cable plugged into the USB sound card. You will notice here it does have something plugged into the audio output as well, going off to the right side. That USB sound card is plugged into the Raspberry Pi with its own power source and the HDMI cable to go into your monitor of choice. Here's a good look at the USB sound card. This specific device does want something plugged into the audio in and the audio out to work correctly. Not all USB sound cards will work exactly the same, so please read the instructions of the device that you get. Now that we have set up the Two-Tone Detect hardware, the next thing we want to do is download the Two-Tone Detect Raspberry Pi image file. This process involves downloading it to a Windows computer, putting the information onto an SD card. My laptop does not have an SD card reader, so I have an external SD card reader plugged into my USB. In the Two-Tone Detect help guide, it says Raspberry Pi image download can be found here. We're going to click that link. Once the image file is done downloading, it should pop up on your computer. You're going to use this option to extract all. So will copy all of the data from the folder. When you choose to extract all, you then need to choose a destination. I've created a folder on my computer here called PyTTD. You can see it down to the lower left of this window. So I'm going to select that folder, choose to extract. Once the files are extracted from the compressed zip folder onto your own folder on your desktop, You'll have this image file saved there, and we're going to come back to that in just a few moments. From the Raspberry Pi website, we downloaded the Raspberry Pi Imager. This is what's going to allow us to take the image file from the Windows computer and put it onto the SD card for us. Under Operating System, I'm going to go to the very bottom that says Use Custom. I'm going to select that IARTTD image file, choose Storage. As I mentioned before, I don't have a SD card reader in my laptop, so I have an external SD card reader. And I'm going to write the information to that SD card. After a writing and verification process, you can see that the 
information has been written to the SD card, and we're going to remove that from the SD card reader and put it into the Raspberry Pi. We are now looking at the screen of the Raspberry Pi. I've taken the SD card out of the SD card reader from my Windows computer, put it into the Raspberry Pi, and allowed it to boot up. You'll notice the Two-Tone Detect logo here in the upper right. That tells us that the Two-Tone Detect is up and running on the Raspberry Pi. However, we've not configured it for our agency yet. Prior to configuring our agency, we want to make sure that all the sound settings are correct. You will notice that there's a speaker icon here in the upper right. When you click on that, this is just the volume control for the volume output. For the moment, we're most interested in the volume input. So we're going to go to the Raspberry Pi logo in the upper left, go to sound and video, pulse audio volume control. Now we're interested in the audio recording and the input devices. For the audio recording, we're going to set this around 30%. For the input devices, we're also going to set this to around 30%. From my own experimentation with the devices and the hardware that I have, 30% for the recording devices and the input devices is perfect. We'll see uh, how that works for us in just a few minutes. After we've adjusted those input volume settings, please also, of course, know that your listening device has its own mechanical volume knob. I would suggest having that volume knob around 10 to 15, maybe 20% of its maximum. Next thing we're going to do is go to the Two-Tone Detect logo in the upper right. Click on that to open the Two-Tone Detect GUI screen. The Two-Tone Detect GUI screen is opened here. It opened in Chromium on my Raspberry Pi. I want to bring your attention to the blue audio level bar right here in the middle of the screen. Now, when you do, when you do see it bouncing around, that's not in reaction to my speaking voice, but that's in reaction to the listening device as it's hearing transmissions come through the radio or just squawks and squelches. Right underneath the audio level indicator, there is a audio squelch. On your listening device, if you have any type of audio squelch control, you want to set it in the same position that you would set it if you were listening to that device with your own ears. You don't want to be hearing white noise all the time. You want to have the audio squelch set so that you're not hearing any noise unless there is a radio transmission of some sort. So set that up on your device with your own ears before plugging it into the two-tone detect system. That way, when your dispatcher does transmit, it's going to go through your listening device, through the audio cable, into I'm responding. This audio squelch here, we want to set this just above, meaning to the right. We want to set this just above where the blue audio level bounces around when there is no transmission. So you'll see the audio level moving just a little bit, but we want to keep that green rectangle above that when there is no transmission. The idea is that when the dispatcher does speak or when there is a radio transmission, it will go to the right of the green rectangle, and then Two-Tone Detect will then be allowed to hear it. You'll notice that my audio input device and my audio output device are both the word pulse. Now remember a moment ago we went to the pulse volume control. Both of these need to say pulse on a Raspberry Pi in order to work correctly. The next thing we want to take a look at is adding the debug screen, the visual representation of Two-Tone Detect to the Raspberry Pi. On a Windows computer, it's very self-explanatory. It's part of the process when Two-Tone opens. On a Raspberry Pi, we're going to go to this icon in the upper left that says Terminal. In the Terminal command prompt, we're going to type in screen space hyphen R. So the two screens we have, on the left we have the debug program, on the right we have the GUI screen. You'll notice on the debug program, there are three distinct columns. The first column that we're going to identify is the tone frequency. This is essentially the megahertz that two-tone detect is picking up. There's going to be a number of digits to the left-hand side of the decimal. We need that information, and sometimes one or two digits to the right of the decimal. The other digits to the right of the decimal is just how specific of a megahertz two-tone is picking up. For our purposes, we typically only need the first character or two. You'll notice there's a single space and then the second column here. The second column is a representation of the volume. It's not decibels, but it's a representation of the volume that Two-Tone is hearing. This middle number, we want to see ideally something between 100 and 20,000. If the number is below 100, Two-Tone may not hear it correctly because it may be too quiet. 
If it's above 20,000, it could be too loud. Imagine, if you will, getting in your car with the radio at full volume. The sound coming from the speakers might be so loud you wouldn't be able to identify the song that's being played or even what genre of music it is. It's just too loud. So ideally, we want to see this middle column between 100 and 20,000. This last column, we're going to ignore that for these purposes, but if you do have questions or issues, contact our support team. We're going to focus on the first two columns. Everything else from this point is the same as on a Windows computer. In a couple moments, we're going to start a video that was recorded on a Windows computer that explains how to program your agency's API key, identifying your tones and reading the debug program on the left side here even further, as well as programming your own tones and running tests. If you find that there's more information on a Raspberry Pi that I didn't cover in this video, please let me know and we'll be sure to add that information in in a future update. Now that we have the audio set up, we need to set up the two-tone detect program itself. The first thing we need to do, if you've not done so already, is to give yourself the permission to manage the two-tone detect program. We're going to do this by going into your I'm Responding website profile and going to the permissions at the bottom. Being that this is a brand new permission, although you're an administrator, you may not have access. At the bottom of your profile, there is a permission to manage two-tone detect settings. Be sure that bubble is checked to yes. When your profile is updated with the permission to manage two-tone detect settings, you'll see that button here on the left side. You're going to go to the option that says generate two-tone detect API key. We are going to copy this API key in its entirety. And now we're going to go to this option that says Edit Config Info. In the Settings Editor, there's a question, do you want to use I'm Responding for Alerting? Put in the API key. All of these other fields that are listed underneath the API key are for non-I am Responding users of the Two-Tone program. You're going to skip all of these other fields. Please don't make any adjustments or settings here. At the bottom, you're going to hit Save. And as I hit save, please take notice of the debug program on the left. As I hit save and then closed the tab, it put in a timestamp, a date and time. This is going to be a trick that you're going to utilize as you're going through the two-tone setup process. As you're running tests and having your dispatch center send dispatches through for you, you may occasionally need to go through that process. So notice again, I'm going to go to edit config info. I'm not going to make any changes. I'm simply going to go to the bottom, hit save. It puts a timestamp on the debug program to the left. I close that tab. So now any data that shows up after that timestamp, I can attribute to the test that I'm running rather than a bunch of, you know, random sounds that occurred prior to my test. So this trick, going to edit config info, I'll demonstrate real quick. We'll allow it to populate with a bunch of data. So let's say that this information here on the left side is the test that I just ran. When I go to the option that says View Debug Info and go to the very bottom of this page, this is all the data that's been populating so far since we opened it. That's a lot of information to send our support team, and we don't know exactly what we're looking at or where. So you'll notice, here's my timestamp. So this is something you can easily highlight and copy and send this data to our support team to analyze for you. This gives us all, pretty much all the information that we need to know about the test that you just ran. I'm going to run a test with some tones so that you can see how it comes across on the system. Just prior to running my test with tones, I'm going to do the little trick I showed you. Edit config info. Just go to the bottom and hit save close that tab and again this is the timestamp that we're going to be referring to after our test is run so we know what data in the debug program is our test data. I'm going to let you hear the tones as I play them. So as you can see the information that populated here on the left side after my timestamp 
the volume level is around the 2000s. It's not above 30,000, it's not above 20,000. And the tone frequencies are listed to the far left. Now, it's ideal if you know what your tones are in advance of setting up two-tone detect so that you know how to program them in. But let's say I did not know what my tones were. Each row that we see here is essentially, so this is one row, each row is essentially 25% of a second. So four rows is one second long. This frequency, 586.2, is essentially one and a half seconds long. So let's presume that this is the tone that I'm going to set up. In the I'm Responding Administrative Functions, under Two-Tone Detect Settings, I'm going to go to Manage Pager Groups, create a new pager group. We're going to call this one Test. And let's look at our debug program one more time. So the frequency that we want is 586.2. And as I mentioned, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 rows long. So that's essentially a second and a half, 586.2. I'm going to change this to a long tone instead of an A and a B tone. 586.2 is programmed in. The tone length, it's not 6 seconds. I'm going to put in 1.4, just a little bit less than 1.5. The reason being is that it's okay to undershoot the sounds, but if you overshoot them, the system will think that it never heard it. So it's okay to undershoot sound length just a little bit. So we've programmed in 586.2 for 1.4 seconds. These other options, we're essentially going to leave them blank. If you need help with anything like that, that'll probably come from our support team. We're going to concentrate on the tone frequency and the tone length. I'm going to save that. So after we've programmed in our long tone, I'm going to do my trick one more time. Edit config info. Go to the bottom, hit save. Close that tab. And that's going to register my timestamp for me on the debug program. Now this time when those same tones play, it will pick up on that 586.2 for 1.4 seconds long. Even though it plays for a hair longer, it's going to recognize it for that length of time and that will trigger it to record my two-tone detect audio. Here we go with our second tone test with a pager group programmed in. So I'm going to cut that test short. The reason I'm going to cut that test short is because you'll notice test page received. That means that it worked. It shows up in this box here on the uh, GUI screen on the right hand side. So we're going to look up at the audio. Here's my timestamp from before the test. When my tone started to play, the volume registering is right around 3000s. That's perfect. And then here's my frequency that I programmed in, 586.2 for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rows. And then the system says, tone set found. All that I needed to do is program the tone the way the system heard it for the length of time that the system hears it, and it now knows that my agency was triggered for a dispatch. And you can see that the debug program erupts with a lot of data, things that don't necessarily need to be understood by you, but all of this activity that's happening is letting you know that it recognized the tone group. It successfully sent the I'm responding pre-alert, and then it starts recording. It's recording all of the talking the dispatcher is doing, or in this case me, and then it says successfully sent IAR audio alert after the threshold of the recording is met. And that's really all there is to two-tone detect. We need to get audio into the computer. We need to make sure that the volume is not too loud or too quiet. Typically too loud is more of a problem. You're going to identify your pager tones, program them into the I'm responding administrative functions, run another test or two or three, making slight adjustments as needed based on the data that we see from the view debug info, and you should be all set. This is a fairly straightforward process, not to be overthought, but there are some key things that we want to do along the way. If you have difficulty, please reach out to the I'm Responding Customer Support Team, and we are most certainly happy to help you.